Um, and, in, in, and the reindeer up in, in the Scandinavian countries are chock-a-block full of cesium because the lichen concentrates cesium-137. Last but not least, I'll talk about plutonium, which is why man fissioned uranium in the first place, 239. There are only two isotopes, basically, that are fissionable, this one and uranium-235. Well, 233 is, and then, then you get into thorium. Notice that Switkowski and other physicists who know nothing are talking about thorium now. Um, if you want to read about thorium, it's in my book, but go to my website called Nuclear Free. Well, you can take my card and look it up, but there's a whole section on thorium. It's uneconomical, and it won't work. But anyway, plutonium, great stuff. Um, each reactor manufactures 500 pounds of it a year. What's that? 250 kilos. I'm now in Australia, I better talk Australian. You need uh, five kilos to make yourself an atomic bomb. You can find the design at the local hardware shop, and if you can steal a lump of plutonium the size of a grapefruit, you've got yourself a nuclear weapon, and plutonium's everywhere. Japan stockpiled 100 tonnes of plutonium. Its half-life is 24,400 years, but we only sell uranium to, to politically stable countries, right? You know? <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't expect a country to become politically unstable within, you know, a generation or two, would you, really? Gaddafi's or George W's rising up, whose IQ is less than 100, or Reagan I met with for an hour and his IQ was 100 and he had impending Alzheimer's. I mean, you wouldn't expect people to do stupid things, would you, because we're infallible. So we only sell, according to Martin Ferguson, uranium, we're going to send it to, sell it to India, who has not signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and India and Pakistan each have over 100 hydrogen bombs and could go to war any day or any night, because it's seen as a sort of, well, I wrote a book called Missile Envy, and it really is a Freudian thing. And if you look at the missile coming out with the two big balls of fire, that's actually what it is. And the generals in the Pentagon hated that book, but they all had one copy on their bookshelves. <laughs> That's what it is. So anyway, we're selling nuclear weapons with impunity. Oh, but it's balance of payments, don't you know? And it's good for our economy. And mining is good for us. It's much worse than selling heroin. We are pushing, can we're cancer pushers. We're pushers of random compulsory genetic engineering. We're pushers of nuclear weapons. And there is no attention paid to this in the media at all. That's why Karen, 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 and Vicky and me, and we've all got to get on television wearing our white coats and our stethoscopes, and we have to talk about this and educate the Australian people about it. And you know what? They're good people, and they'll move. Now, plutonium's interesting. It's an iron analogue. It uh, is not absorbed from the gut except in a neonatal gut whose gut is immature or in chlorinated water which helps the absorption. However, it's absorbed, it's inhaled into the lung in powdered form where it can cause, a, you know, a millionth of a gram, a microgram is carcinogenic, but when they injected it into dogs, they didn't find a dose low enough that didn't give every dog cancer 10 to the minus 9 grams. It's incredibly carcinogenic. It's transferred by macrophages to the mediastinal lymph glands where it can cause lymphoma, stored in the liver where it can cause liver cancer, bone, bone cancer, leukemia, and multiple myeloma. Um, it crosses the placenta. The placenta lets nothing pass except plutonium, which it thinks is iron, where in the first trimester it can damage a cell that's going to cause uh, teratogenic changes, and every male in the northern hemisphere has a tiny load of plutonium in his gonads next to the spermatogonia, the precursors of the sperm, where the genes are being mutated and passed on generation to generation, and if the man gets cremated, out goes the smoke with the plutonium so someone else can inhale it ad infinitum, and so you can see there's going to be an exponential increase in genetic disease, not just in humans, but all species, plants and animals. Yeah, it was radiation that induced evolution, but it takes billions of years for a fish to develop lungs, birds to develop wings, us to evolve with our brilliant neocortex opposing thumbs standing on our hind limbs. But now what we're doing is totally destroying the process of evolution, and we understand it. 
We understand Muller's experiments with Drosophila fruit fly. We understand radiation biology and carcinogenesis. We understand, and yesterday someone was talking about chemicals. We live in a constant cocktail of 80,000 chemicals in common use, most of which are not tested for carcinogenicity. It's up to us to prove they're unsafe and the chemical companies don't have to prove a thing. And they launched them. I mean, I was in a hotel the other day, nice being, being and it smelled sort of nice, but I knew it was artificial perfume. And those perfumes, you know, some of them contain materials that are probably carcinogenic. And I write about the chemicals in this book, um, which is outside, plus global warming overpopulation. 200 years ago, there were one billion of us. Now there are seven. We're doomed. And we could easily stop overpopulation by educating women, providing them with contraceptions, um, and, and feeding them properly. Why aren't we doing it? Well, look who's running the world. Look at the politicians in America, totally out to lunch. I was in love with Obama when he was running. Now I can't even watch his photograph because he's totally into nuclear power and weapons. And look at our politicians. Julia Gillard wouldn't know, well, I won't use a rude expression, but she doesn't know anything about foreign affairs. And Martin Ferguson runs the energy policy, who is totally scientifically and medically illiterate and rude to the point of, uh, I won't go into it. Um, so we've got a lot of things to fix. So that's, I want to show you the slides of Fukushima, and then I'll just go into something else. Okay, so here are the reactors um, when normal. And didn't they look nice? Nice sort of blue and white spotted buildings. And that's what happened after the hydrogen explosions. Three. And this reactor, um, two, three. This one had uh, MOX fuel in it, had plutonium mixed with, with uh, uranium, which is terribly dangerous. So I've told you the toxicity of plut plutonium. Okay. The next one, look at this. And all that steam's radioactive. Every day, right now, 12,000 trillion becquerels of radiation are escaping into the atmosphere. A, becquer a becquerel is a disintegration per second. 12,000 trillion becquerels. And there's nothing in our media about it. I must say, Murdoch, I think, is, one of, is the most dangerous man in the world. Here's reactor one. Look at it. And that's an inside version of one of the reactors. And this is a fallout um, in March. So here's the reactor. Three days, this is very high radiation, 3,000 rads. I mean, that, if you're exposed to that, you die within days or less. Uh, the LD50, when half the people die, is 250 rads. Six days, and here's the west coast of the US, and now they've been picking up plutonium in Seattle, in British Columbia, the peaches in California are radioactive, but on the whole, the EPA is not properly testing. If you don't want to find out, don't test. And here's the way it, the, the radiation escaped. So this is the 18th of March. The accident was on the 11th. And this is Japan, and here it goes across to the US and Canada. Um, this is only three days later, and it's spreading right across the US and over to Europe. And then on the 24th of March, it almost envelops the Northern Hemisphere. Um, this is um, released by the Department of Energy in America. They t sent up a plane to measure uh, the radiation, and they found that the radiation was 3 to 12.5 terabecquerels. I think that's what it is. And people were evacuated from Chernobyl at 500,000. Becquerels, 500,000. And this is terabecquerels, that's trillions of becquerels. And people are still living in extremely radioactive areas, including 300,000 children. And instead of evacuating the children, and the, Amer the, the Russians were much more proactive, they got the kids out, they'd put radiation monitors around their necks, little pink ones. And so they're measuring, but all they're measuring is the gamma radiation. Do you remember? They're not measuring the material that they're taking into their bodies in their stomachs, their livers, their brains, their thyroids. You can't measure that unless you put people in a whole body counter and measure the spectrum of radiation that's being emitted from the various isotopes. Many of those children are destined to die or develop cancer. 
there will be hundreds of thousands of cancers developing now in Fukushima. And this is, I thought, an interesting picture, July 30th, not long after the accident. And this is kind of spring, early, early summer. The azaleas are all dead. And this, these are the ginkgos, look. That's radiation landing. Now you can just imagine that's going to human bodies and what it's doing to the cells. I, I, I want to end with one other thing, um, which we are not aware of and it's not talked about. Uh, I don't know if you know, but we've still got 22,000 hydrogen bombs in the world. And Russia and America own 97% of them. And each Russia and America have about... Ru America's got 12,000 targeted on Russia... Russia's got about 2,200 targeted on America, but not just America. We're targeted. We've got 34 U.S. bases. All our cities are targeted. Japan's targeted. China's targeted by America. Since the Cold War ended, America decided to China, target China too because they need a new enemy. And the Pentagon writes about this. And they're sur surrounding China with military bases, as I speak, in all the stands and all around in Japan and the like. Europe's targeted and, and England's targeted. Incidentally, if the Second World War was fought today, Europe would be uninhabitable for the rest of time because all the reactors, there are hundred, over 100 in Europe, they'd all melt down. So you can only have wars now in countries with no reactors, developing countries. And as the Pentagon has to have wars because it spends over a trillion dollars a year on weapons... If you spent a million dollars a minute since Jesus was born, you would have just spent a trillion dollars. So America is a land of death, not life. And it, what its main production is weapons, and they export them. Now, how likely is this to happen? Well, I flew over the Dakotas the other day, and if you look down there, you can see the missile silos from the air with the roads connecting them. In each silo is one missile, and on each missile are three hydrogen bombs, and there are two men in each silo, aged 18 to 21, Pavlovian dogs, yes sir, no sir, press the button sir, each armed with a pistol, one to shoot the other if one shows signs of deviant behaviour. Come on, think about it. Which one's likely to shoot first? The deviant one. I've talked to their girlfriends before they go down, some of them take drugs before they go down, um, and they've got a, a two locks 12 feet apart, so one man can't launch the missile alone, but they've worked out if they tie a string in one key, one man can turn both locks, initiate a nuclear war and the end of life on Earth. There are 40 H-bombs targeted on New York, yet they have a, the gall to talk about terrorists. Who are the real terrorists? Who are the real rogue states threatening to destroy life on Earth? And they're friends. We can't even talk about the communists these days. Russia and America are friends. They're trading. Russia's getting very rich. There are 60 targeted on Washington, D.C., 60 on Moscow. Um, and how long would it take? After launch, the weapons take half an hour. In that time, the Russians pick up the attack. They've launched it's all over in an hour. One hour it takes. And what happens is, is if a bomb, where are we? We're in Sydney. Um, and so we don't have the radio on to hear that we might be under a nuclear attack. We won't hear the weapon come in at 20 times the speed of sound. Sydney's targeted with at least one H-bomb, but probably many more. As I speak, it will land here and explode with a heat inside the centre of the sun, digging a hole three-quarters of a mile wide and 800 feet deep, turning us and the earth below to radioactive fallout. Five miles in all directions including the dolphins, which I saw surfing this morning, will be vaporised. A little boy was reaching up into Hiroshima to catch a red dragonfly in his hand against the blue sky, and there was a blinding flash, and he disappeared. And he left his shadow on the pavement, which is now in the Hiroshima Museum. Five miles from here, everyone's vaporised with heat inside the centre of the sun. 20 miles from here in all directions, everyone has third-degree burns, people turning into missiles travelling at 100 miles an hour till they hit the nearest solid object, and then the whole area engulfed in a spontaneous holocaust of 3,000 square miles, and everything and everyone will burn. And as cities are full of oil refineries now and plastics and wood and you name it, and all, as all the cities burn, you only need a 1,000 bombs dropping on 100 cities to create the situation. 
but it's many more that will happen, uh, a huge cloud of toxic black radioactive smoke will rise up into the stratosphere and circle the Earth for up to five years, blocking out the sun. It will be cold, it will be dark, 